So my name is Chris Warswick. I'm, uh, I've been asked to chair this session. I'm uh, a member of the Department of Economics and I'm currently Associate Dean Research and International for the Faculty of Public Affairs. Really pleased to uh, attend and in a small way participate in this event. As, as uh, Dean Plourd said this morning, this, um, this Research uh, Excellence Symposium is related to the FPA Research Excellence Award that um, Professor Laura MacDonald won last year, and this uh, wonderful event is uh, coming out of her efforts and, and support from uh, the Dean's office. Um, I, I think for people in the room, I probably don't need to spend a lot of time introducing Laura, but I, I would say that you know she's a, a, a wonderful researcher with uh, expertise in, in Latin American and North American politics. Um, not only has she won this Research Excellence Award once, she's actually won it once before, and she's won the University Research Achievement Award. And if you've ever been any, on any of these committees, there's always lots of disappointed, excellent scholars. So it's, it's really to her credit that uh, she's been um, identified so often by the Faculty of Public Affairs and the University. So I think I'll leave it there. So the um, the, the title of her presentation is Civil Society in the New North America. So Laura will speak and then we'll have comments later by Angela McEwen, who's senior economist at uh, the Canadian Union of Public Employees. Thanks a lot, Chris. And actually, I did change my title, as is the tradition. So uh, there it is. Um, so uh, before I start, I just did really want to thank Chris and the wonderful Cassie who did all the hard work to organize this event. She's amazing, as well as Kyla, who's given me tons of support in the Dean's office over the years. It's a, I'm so fortunate to work with such supportive, uh, dedicated, talented uh, people. So um, the talk I'm going to give today uh, comes out of work I've been doing actually for decades, um, aging myself a bit here, um, around uh, civil society activism in North America. I w wrote quite a bit about this in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, and then I kind of stopped doing it because there wasn't much going on in that terrain and now it's back in fashion lots of things are going on so uh it's great to get back to this work and i've been fortunate enough to uh, receive a uh, sshrc grant to uh start a new five-year project looking at transnational activism in the region focusing not just on uh, trade issues uh, but three general areas labor and trade relations migration relations and mexican human rights um, so we're looking at the region not just as something about trade, which is what was mostly discussed this morning, but uh, broader networks of collaboration and conflict that transverse the region. Um, and also would like to mention that I, some of this work was also supported by a, another SHRC grant uh, that I'm a humble part of on alternatives to austerity. And I worked with Nadia Ibrahim, who's going to speak this afternoon. Uh, uh, from the trend just, uh, tra Trade Justice Network on that work. So a little bit is coming out of that. So um, let's see if I can work this. Um, so these are some of the broad research questions we're going to be looking at and that I'll talk a bit about today. Um, so we're seeking to understand how transnational ties between civil society groups um, have changed post-NAFTA, like post-NAFTA 1.0, leading up to 2.0, and after, in, and especially around the context of the renegotiations. Um, and uh, I'm also interested in the different types of um, regimes that are in place in the three countries and how that complicates or enriches the work of civil society activists, how they navigate those terrains of these diverse types of political regimes, which do not seem to be converging very much. There's not a lot of political convergence happening in this region. Um, and, and then I'm going to talk a, a little bit specifically about the Canadian case, which was discussed somewhat this morning. So, But in general, I'm interested in the role of civil society, mainstream accounts of uh, trade issues, of regional integration, 
tend to uh, ignore the role of civil society, or often if it's brought in, it's only in a negative context that these people are holding up good trade agreements and their obstacles, or if ever the government does wants to do something sort of progressive, it's seen as an obstacle to a better deal that might have been achieved if only these uh, um, uh, ignorant, <laughs> um, annoying people hadn't kind of raised their voices and said, wait, wait, there might be something wrong with this trade agreement for a uh, majority of people. So, uh, so civil society, if it appears at all in dominant accounts, is most often portrayed as destructive, negative, and reactive, rather than playing uh, as they themselves see themselves as playing a positive role in democratic decision making. So this leads to my arguments about the importance of understanding the role of civil society, uh, which is not the prime mover in these relationships, but far from it, if only, they say. Um, uh, but far from the par prime mover, but I think they do have a role to play in shaping the timing and uh, progress and some of the details of, of trade agreements and other types of agreements in the region and in a longer term sense in constructing a healthier, more democratic region. Um, and another argument is about looking at the state. I was thinking this morning, it's a little bit like, uh, well, Robert Putnam talked about two level games, if anyone's a political economy geek in the room. Uh, so he said like there's the transnational level and there's domestic level and the negotiators have to play off the two sides. But in this case, it's more like, you know, in Star Trek, there's a version of chess where it's like, like 3D. <laughs> so there's three levels, I think, to that chessboard, and they're all and the and the later versions of Star Trek, the the characters, the the chess pieces are actually moving around and doing crazy things. Am I right? It's been a little while since I watched Star Trek, but that's my vague impression. So that's kind of what we have here with with North America. That it's not some neat two level game, which Putnam was adding complexity when he said there's two levels, duh. But um, now we have all these multiple levels that interact and, and players are playing off against other, you know, domestic actors in one country are playing against actors in another country, maybe at the state and civil society interacting. It's really, really messy. So it's really hard to make generalizations and I won't probably make any um, profound uh, 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 arguments about that today, but I'm just trying to sketch out the way I'm thinking about it. So um, I'm uh, so when I think about this, I'm in influenced by a theoretical work that's been done about the role of civil society and transnational activism. I've put up a classic uh, de uh, definition by uh, Jan Art Schulte about what civil society is, uh, which itself is a topic of, of uh, debate. And it, this came out a bit this morning that there's civil society. We usually think of civil society as being like left wing groups. But in fact, there is business civil society. And in this story that I'm going to talk about, there's also very much right wing civil society, which is not necessarily business. But in the in the United States, much of civil society has been uh, dominated by right wing political actors who have fed the Trump uh, phenomenon. So um, so it's a little bit messy as well. And um, and another insight from the literature that I use is the idea that comes from Sidney Tarot, who's a famous social movement organization scholar who writes about the inherent tendency of transnational activism to be cyclical in nature, um, you know, sort of optimists about civil society sort of think, well, it'd be nice if they could just work together and gradually build up in a steady, gradual process, higher and higher levels of collaboration. But in the real world, it doesn't work that way. There are moments of openings in the political opportunity structures that permit civil society actors to come in and raise their voices and have a role to play. And, and, and often, in our case, uh, trade agreements have been that uh, galvanizing moment that creates openings uh, for civil society to play an important role. But then they tend to, those linkages maybe decline over time or they transform into other types of collaboration. So we can't expect a kind of teleological dynamic where gradually over time these linkages become more and more important. 
this is an example of a kind of more optimistic version of um, of the of thinking about the role of civil society coming out of the new regionalisms theory that Tim Shaw is in the back of the room uh, has written a lot about from Jean Grugel out of the new regionalism literature that uh, recognizes, and this is a, a keen and uh, important aspect of that theoretical tradition that it recognizes that civil society does play an important role and in both empirically in terms of shaping the process of integration, but also normatively and morally in terms of raising alternative perspectives, alternative information sources as well. As Meredith said this morning, governments recognize they need more sources of information about what's happening in society if they're going to make sound decisions. So they do turn to civil society, maybe somewhat instrumentally in order to manipulate them, but still they have to turn to civil society for input at certain stages, some governments being more likely to or not. So this is kind of a more optimistic view, um, uh, perhaps more in influenced by what's happening in South America. Um, but it's an interesting perspective on what's going on. So looking backwards, I'm not going to talk very much about the history of transnational activism in North America because I've asked my dear friend John Foster, who's somewhere around, to there you are, um, to talk about the history of that uh, uh, struggle around the first NAFTA agreement as someone who is involved in the activism and also writing about that uh, history. But just to point out that in, during the debate on the first Canada-US free trade, trade agreement in the late 80s and then leading up to the NAFTA, there was the emergence of uh, strong um, coalitions within each of the three countries that were actively mobilizing and, and leading debate and critique of that neoliberal model of trade integration which the governments were promoting. And uh, so those emerged within each of the three countries and also established inter interesting forms of collaboration across uh, state borders. This is not to say that tensions did not exist within these groups. Uh, there were interesting tensions, for example, between English, Canadian, and Quebec-based uh, civil society groups, and also uh, differences between more radical and more reformist civil society positions, particularly I would say on the environmental side, uh, there was kind of a split that allowed Clinton to come in with his uh, side accord uh, solution to those problems. <clears throat> and then uh, also most notably, as I was indicating earlier, there was in the United States uniquely, there was the emergence of right wing opposition to NAFTA. Uh, focused on the threat of flight of U.S. jobs, the, the great sucking sound that uh, Ross Perot shot, talked about, and also the threat, uh, the perceived threat of Mexican migrants under, and, and this comes, at, this came out uh, in this period in the early 90s the, under uh, Pat Buchanan, the, uh, they explicitly adopted the slogan of American first, America first, uh, which has now, of course, taken life again in rather uh, disturbing uh, form under um, President Trump. So the, the, the seeds for the emergence of the Trump phenomenon were sowed in civil society in the United States in the 90s and have come, those chickens have come home to roost. But that form of civil society activism, of course, was resolutely national and not transnational in scope, not at all interested in transnational activism. Uh, so uh, we know the story that there was opposition, but they weren't successful. There were side ag agreements uh, passed on labor and the environment, which uh, are widely critiqued by civil society organizations as being largely ineffective. Uh, especially the Labour Accord was probably particularly ineffective. It lacked teeth, unlike uh, the more recent trade agreements, there is, there's some enforcement mechanism. The first version of this in NAFTA completely lacked those um, enforcement mechanisms, um, but it did set the stage for later development. Um, after this fight was over, then uh, those civil society groups kind of morphed. They ver became very important in the emergence of a continental uh, movement against the free trade area of the Americas, which actually was rather successful. 
and in other sites like the WTO. So, um, so just to talk a little bit about what happened afterwards, I think there was this kind of cyclical tendency of uh, after the kind of rise, dramatic rise of civil society uh, activism, both within and across borders, there was a, a, a sort of decline as NAFTA became sort of accepted or, or taken for granted in the, in the popular imagination that the reforms had already been implemented, so there wasn't so much to talk about anymore. Um, and so the coalitions kind of disintegrated, but there was still some cooperation in the, in the post-NAFTA era, particularly um, some uh, civil society groups did choose to engage around the labor side of course and the environmental side of course. They were able, even if there was no enforcement, they were able to raise pet petitions to the uh, tri-national bodies that were cre created. And at least the, the, that activity did create a strong cooperation between uh, civil soci society actors particularly I would say US and Mexico, uh, because most of this effort was directed at improving environmental and labor st uh, standards in Mexico, which was the worst offender in these respects. Um, um, and then there were other forms of collaboration um, that uh, emerged around uh, issues like migrant workers, the role of migrant workers. Um, and this also, uh, Christina Gabriel and I have written quite a bit about uh, the role of Canadian NGOs in collaboration with uh, Mexican uh, workers um, trying to improve labor standards in Canada for the migrant workers that are, are also part of regional integration. Uh, um, the many Mexican workers who come to Canada every year, increasing numbers of them, and um, have labored under, you know, there's some extremely popular program for, for many workers because they can uh, earn more money than they would in the horrible labor conditions and horrible pay that they're going to get in Mexico. But there are also deeply problematic aspects of their uh, work, and they're very vulnerable to exploitation. So uh, unions like the U United Food and Commercial Workers in particular, but other civil society work uh, groups have uh, worked uh, with Mexican counterparts to try to improve conditions for Mexican workers in Canada. And so that's a very important precedent. Um, and um, moving on, there was also uh, some uh, quite considerable opposition to the Security and Prosperity Partnership of North America that was uh, created in the early 2000s and broad critique of that mechanism. I think, um, Chris, were you saying, who somebody was saying that it was sort of Mexico, that, uh, Julian, you were sort of saying it was because of Mexico that it didn't work very well, but I think it was largely civil society that became very vocal in opposition to that uh, framework for continental uh, op, um, uh, regulate, uh, sorry, integration. Um, and uh, and particularly, again, right-wing groups and left-wing groups were both um, found that mechanism extremely problematic and contributed, I think they were important contributors to the failure and the eventual cancellation of that trinational format. And one of the major critiques that was made by both right and left, interestingly, was the lack of public consultation, that these were secretive, talks that were going on behind closed doors. Nobody knew what they were talking about. There was no, there, the business was invited in. They were given their own forum and they were, they were basically allowed to set the agenda for what uh, was gonna happen on the prosperity side of this arrangement at least. But other civil society actors were never invited in. And so that led to a broad, spe a broad um, sorry, I just got back from Germany last night and my mouth's not working very well. Um, uh, so w widespread critique of those types of mechanisms that were seen as deepening integration without taking into account the, the real interests and needs of the broader population. So we get to the moment of the renegotiations. Um, and I would say there has not been a kind of resurgence of high level mobilization 
of citizens across the three countries, partly for the reasons that Meredith was talking about, that I wouldn't say that NAFTA is popular, that people really think it's good, but they don't really think it's bad enough that they really want to get out on the streets and mobilize against it. But on the other hand, um, oh, there was a tri-national meeting in Mexico in August 2017 uh, that brought together some of the participants in the first wave of opposition to NAFTA, um, although it was mostly Mexican groups that attended that meeting, but they did issue a critique of, of the process that was going on at that moment. Um, but what I think we've seen uh, instead, and partly because of the Canadian government being uh, willing to actually talk to civil society actors, particularly unions and indigenous groups, um, there was more systematic consultation. So we see more, more uh, of semi-institutionalized forms of collaboration and consultation happening in the context of the, of the renegotiations. In particular, I would say, uh, and we'll hear more about this in the next panel, that labor was particularly active um, in um, entering into dialogue with the, with the trade negotiation office from Canada and put forward some constructive proposals. Trump was talking to labor. Um, there was sort of a tendency for the two Canadian labor centrals to talk to each other, the Canadian and American labor centrals. And as Julian was describing, nobody really knew what to do with Mexican labor because it had been co-opted for so many years by the previous semi-authoritarian uh, state, the, the pre-government. Uh, so there weren't, the, the independent labor movement is still pretty small and marginal and, and beleaguered. So the, the US and Canadian um, uh, union officials were just weren't sure what to do with Mexico, what to, how to find an appropriate interlocutor uh, on the Mexican side who could represent union interests or labor interests more broadly. Um, but this is a somewhat concerning, of course, as we move forward, I would say that Mexico is kind of left out of that process, but maybe we'll hear more about that from Angelo and, and others about where we go with that. Um, so, um, yes, yeah, so just to move on, I think um, we're stuck in the situation where we have civil society was very active. There's still a lot of memory of that period and a lot of learning that happened in that period and uh, potential contributions to the discussion and government too has learned that they need to talk to civil society, that these trade agreements don't work very well if you just keep uh, civil society outside of the door while the, while the, so, what was Julian's phrase, the side room negotiations are going on with business. It's not a very credible way of negotiating trade agreements. Uh, so we have civil society on the one side. On the other side, we have these new, or relatively new governments in place and three, I, what I characterize as three different kind of types of regime in the three countries that complicates the process of coming up with trade agreements on the one side, but also how does civil society react to these uh, regimes. So in Canada, we have uh, what I call progressive neoliberal government, and I'm going to talk about that in, the, in a moment. Uh, in the US, I would say uh, we have a reactionary populist government that is erratic and unpredictable and selectively interested in keeping workers happy, but uh, uh, to a very limited extent, I would say. And then Mexico, we've sh undergone this dramatic shift in the regime from a uh, poster child for neoliberalism, a very technocratic neoliberal regime, in contrast with the Canadian version, to uh, what I'm calling progressive populism, but not thinking of populism as inevitably a bad thing. I think there's good aspects of the populist government that has emerged, very good things about it, which I'll mention at the end of the talk. So in terms of Canada, uh, we have this new uh, progressive trade agenda that Meredith mentioned. It includes elements such as uh, workers' rights, including elements such as workers' rights, environmental protection, gender equality, 
right of governments to regulate in the national interest, transparency, consultation with a broad range of civil society actors, et cetera. And it is a pretty dramatic shift in policy style uh, from the conservative government for sure. And a breath of fresh air, I would say, for most civil society actors. Um, and uh, certainly Americans, when they hear anything about this uh, policy, think it's you know incredible and, <laughs> and uh, impressive uh, compared to what uh, progressive movements are dealing with in the United States. However, um, uh, when I'm thinking about this, I use the term uh, progressive neoliberalism, which I picked up from, uh, or I stole, I did not steal, I cite correctly from uh, <laughs> Nancy Fraser's uh, work um, from 2017. Um, because I think this is an incredibly great way of describing what our current government is doing. So Fraser says that uh, before Trump, US politics had been dominated by a hegemonic bloc that she labels progressive neoliberalism. And it came out, she says, under the first under the Clintons and then under the Obamas, uh, in recognition of the fact that on its own, neoliberalism is not very effective in generating constituencies. It just can't function very well if it lacks any mechanism to legitimate uh, its uh, actions in the eyes of the general public. So she says that um, these new Democrats, not our new de Democrats, but Demo new Democrats in the US were borrowing or stealing ideas from uh, progressive movements to a, um, legitimate their views. Uh, Adrienne Roberts also talks about transnational national bez business fe feminism that also does a similar thing. And I also draw on the work of Elizabeth Prugel, who talks about how feminist politics have been neoliberalized in contemporary capitalism, having gone to bed with capitalism rather than challenging its exclusionary dimensions. So when we see Freeland or Trudeau talking about feminist trade policy, um, we should be a little bit suspicious about what they're up to, not that they are not themselves, you know, maybe genuinely committed to feminism, but their idea of what a feminist trade policy uh, would look like is maybe not that much, does not share that much with the views of actual feminist actors. Uh, so there's certainly efforts to co-opt pop popular movements here. But I think there's also, um, as Prugel says, it, this may represent uh, an opportunity for progressive groups to push further on the door, opening up that door uh, towards more inclusive uh, styles of politics and uh, opening up alternative meanings of trade policies and, and creating new spaces for engagement by uh, progressive civil society. So I'm taking this more uh, optimistic, less cynical view of what's going on. Okay, so um, in conclusion, the I'd say the role of transnational civil society activism has fluctuated over time, and that's not surprising. That's the nature of the beast, as um, Taro uh, uh, offers uh, uh, in his uh, theorization of it. And we need to pay attention to the kinds of political opportunity structures that are opened up by new political alignments that are happening with these three governments. Um, a particularly interesting aspect that wasn't discussed too much this morning was uh, what's going on in Mexico in terms of labor reform. There are very substantial forms of labor reform that are going through, um, well, uh, have already been included in the Constitution and are the, the implementing legislation is now going through uh, Congress and that's going to be really interesting, important opportunity for Mexican workers to actually and that kind of race to the bottom phenomenon that was so prevalent in the first form of NAFTA to the detriment of the situation of Mexican workers. And uh, to conclude, I think p current political changes in the region do open, open up new opportunities for rethinking how transnational civil society actors can engage with the regional discourses and practices and um, push them in a more progressive direction. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me here, Lauren. Congratulations. Um, it's really great to see your work uh, recognized and celebrated.
Uh, I attended the trinational meeting in Mexico, and I was um, at the Canadian Labor Congress as an economist following the trade file during the NAFTA renegotiation. So I have recently moved to CUPE, but I was kind of very much involved in this from the civil society uh, perspective. And I think Laura has asked me to kind of um, reflect on her comments based on my experience with renegotiating NAFTA. Um, and so there's, I, I think, really a lot of value in what you've said uh, to learn and reflect and see maybe how we could be more effective in the future. Um, once Trump was elected uh, and it became clear that we were going to ha have to renegotiate NAFTA, we organized kind of a, a medium-sized meeting at the Canadian Labor Congress of mostly labor, but also environment and other allies, um, because some of those networks had uh, frayed to some extent and were a little bit limited, but we wanted to bring as many people from that first fight together to figure out what are we going to do, how are we going to respond now. And there was a diversity of opinion, um, but the consensus, especially I think with labor, was that we are so integrated with the US right now that we just don't think uh, a battle where we say, tear up NAFTA, let's go it alone, is going to fly. And so we kind of chose the more, um, let's get the best deal we can get. How do we coordinate and, and find pressure? And so we did try to coordinate with American labor, with both within Canada, within groups that opposed, and then across borders. Uh, and. And that was sometimes difficult. So the Canadian government, based on the different contexts in each country, so the Canadian government was going with this progressive trade agenda. And we said, well, we know they're probably just symbolic, but we're going to use this language. We're going to kind of take it at face value and try to hold them to it. We know that, that well, we don't necessarily believe that they mean it. Uh, we don't necessarily believe that trade can be progressive. <laughs> um, but we can try to hold them to this language and get a better deal than we would have otherwise, um, and to kind of get insert ourselves behind the scenes at in discussions um, to at least know what was going on so we could be prepared as well. Um, in the United States, Trump, as was Chris mentioned on the panel this morning, is actually very good at dividing and conquering. <laughs> and so he would offer things to labor that they wanted, basically that they couldn't say no to, that they'd asked for. Um, and they were caught in situations several times where they were standing beside him as he was doing something else awful, right? And they were in this awkward position and he really um, is just masterful at that. And that made it very difficult um, for us to necessarily always agree with the position that um, the US labor movement was taking, uh, which then made it even more difficult for uh, unions that were um, actually, um, Canada has international unions where members belong, are members are both in Canada and the United States and sometimes in Mexico, so sometimes the union has members in all three countries, um, or like uh, Unifor, where there was a close relationship between Unifor and the auto workers in the States, and so they, they have that closer relationship, but they also recognize that they're not always, their incentives aren't always aligned. Um, and so how do we all come together from these different contexts with these different incentives and find some kind of common ground that we can at least all be trying to push in the same direction and not, not against each other? Like um, Meredith said on the first panel, you know, if you're united, it's, it's, you're going to get much more likely to get what you want. If government um, can divide you, then that's, that's where it falls apart and you don't make any headway. Uh, so when we went to Mexico uh, for this meeting and we met with uh, the independent labor unions and the rest of Mexican civil society, it became very obvious their position was completely different. They were shut out from the government. It wasn't an option. The inside game wasn't an option for them. And so their option was oppose it completely, rip it up. And I think the, the context that they've been in where they've been fighting against privatization and privatization has basically been a, a union busting tool of the government, uh, governments in Mexico, um, they were far less favorable to see any benefit to themselves from NAFTA, where workers in Canada could say, well, we think there's been some wins and losses overall. We think it's gone down a, maybe a, not a great route, but um, 
we can see that the, the auto industry has benefited, for example. Um, in, in Mexico, there was no gains. It was obvious to them that there were no gains from NAFTA and there was no, no way to find a common ground. And we struggled um, over the course of that, that weekend to come out with a statement that everybody could even agree upon. <laughs> um, it was quite difficult to just even have some kind of motherhood statement out of that meeting. Um, and the thing that was, that was really interesting and I think valuable to have at that meeting were people who had been involved in the struggle the first time. And we had the lessons learned and we had some of that experience and some of those networks and connections. Um, but because the context had changed so much, I don't think we were able to, um, to take as much advantage of them as, as we had maybe hoped, which was quite interesting uh, to me. So we, I went to Mexico thinking that this would be great and, and it ended up um, not, we ended up deciding not to put a lot of energy into rebuilding the connections that we had had before. We have the Trade Justice Network where, uh, that Nadia will be talking about later, where we have a coalition of environmental groups um, and labor groups where we at least kind of discuss uh, the, our agenda and how to, how to coordinate in, in some manner. So we continued on that front. Um, unions that had already been doing some work because even public sector unions um, after the last NAFTA had continued doing international solidarity work. And so they had relationships with, you know, um, sister public sector unions in the United States or Mexico. So they had some connections. Um, so they knew maybe who to talk to or who to, who to, who to bounce ideas off about what this position would mean, uh, whether we could find a common, common ground. Um, but it was just, there was no common ground with, with Mexico. So it wasn't gonna happen, but we did try to coordinate more between um, Canada and the United States where that was possible. We would meet at um, where there were negotiating sites, we would meet and we would gather uh, even some friendly US um, legislators, some friendly Canadian legislators, and we would sit and have discussions about what was the strategy, what was the intel, how could we move forward, um, how could we, we get the best outcome that we were looking for. Um, but it was hampered, again, by these different contacts, by this, this relationship. And, um, and so I think that made it, uh, because the threat of Trump, because he so successfully weaponized the uncertainty, I love that phrase, by the way, um, we couldn't counter that uh, effectively. And so it came down to the fact that um, there was just too much uncertainty that the, the threat to the economy would be too huge if we didn't get NAFTA. So whatever deal we could get was better than no deal. Um, so I do think that in some instances we were able to take t some, some terrible things off the table to get better proposals in there. The labor um, reforms in Mexico I think are a great example of that. The auto um, parts I think is another, another example of that. But um, Overall, in terms of the labor chapter, I don't, or the environment chapter, I have no hope that it'll be more successful than the uh, side agreements were. It, uh, there's, there seems to be, um, no, there's no, nothing in those structurally shift the, the neoliberal economic damage that's done by the rest of the deal. So there's no, no structural shift. And when we met with negotiators and tried to explain our position, um, there was simply no understanding on their part of where we were coming from. It was as if we were speaking Greek to them. It was literally, they didn't understand the questions we were asking because their position was so far from ours um, ideologically, uh, which was, was enlightening, um, but also um, sad, <laughs> just sad. Uh, because they absolutely, the, the public, um, servants who worked on this worked very hard. Um, I feel felt like they were doing the best job that they could, uh, but they absolutely thought it was essential that we have a new NAFTA with the United States, or you know the sky would fall in. There was no understanding of um, of the the consequences, the economic consequences. Uh, of maybe not having an <laughs> NAFTA that, you know, we would come through that and there, there would be, we would live another day, it would all be fine. 
um, that it was, it was very much um, in their imagination, kind of the end of the world if there was no NAFTA, uh, for sure. Um, yeah, I think, I think that, that one of the lessons uh, that we would recognize is that we don't always have to put a lot of energy into building those networks in between um, and that it's okay to take advantage of moments of solidarity and move on. Um, and that, um, but the re I think the reason why trade agreements provide that moment for civil society on the left I'm speaking about to come together is because individually in between those moments, we're all fighting the same thing. And trade agreements are a symbol of that. Thing. They are a tool of that agenda, that economic uh, shift towards a different type of economy. And so when we can understand that, uh, we can align our, and we can understand each other's battles. I found sometimes environmentalists, for example, would say something that I thought was harmful to the overall agenda, but it was simply because they didn't have a labor analysis. And I'm sure labor unions have that said things that environmentalists have felt were harmful to their goals, but it's because we didn't have that analysis. And so that if we have that analysis across movements in between the trade agreements, that will end up being more successful uh, when those, those unifying moments do come. We probably have 15, 20 minutes for questions. Does anybody want to lead off? Yeah. Do you want to go to the mic, please? Edward Atraji, aerospace engineer, National Research Council, and now retired. Civil societies are wonderful if they're advancing genuinely the uh, interests of the country in which they live. But increasingly, I find there are civil societies, so-called civil societies, advancing the interest of a group that are outside of the country. So for instance, in, in, insofar as climate change is concerned, does it really matter whether the coal is burnt in the United States or in China, insofar as climate change is concerned? We have managed to export all our emissions to China, but at the same time, we have exported all the jobs to China. At what point do we start to balance things so that we don't suffer from the things that we want improved in our country and not do it at the expense of others? Okay, uh, it's been suggested we might take two or three questions and then answer all together. Yeah. I, I think it's a question for, for the two of you. My name is Sergio from the Department of Political Science. I'm just curious about the, the the effect. Like two weeks two weeks ago, I think it was Is this for me or for, for I think for both in okay. a way because it for two weeks ago I think it was announced in Mexico the emergence of this international confederation of workers by this senator who was actually uh, exiled in Canada for five years and now is uh, a senator Napoleon Gomez Urrutia, and he's creating this new umbrella organization of, uh, of worker unions. So the question would be, do you think this, this would reproduce the same type of, uh, let's say, structure, or the organizations co-opted by the government in the pre-time, or does this tends to put some light into a more, let's say, independent form of union, say, of, of of union in, in, in Mexico? Because I just find that you two mentioned probably something, some contrasting, with, like Laura, you were mentioning that the labor movements were as, were left aside in the, because there was actually in Mexico not, not, not a, there was not a, an independent, an independent actor with whom Canadian and US counterparts could interact. And on the other hand, Angela, you were mentioning that, that I would like to hear with whom did you actually, in that meeting in August 2017, did the Canadian 
<laughs> unions met, no? who, were, who were those, those uh, first in Mexico? And, 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 yeah, and in general, what is this emergence of the new International Confederation of Workers yeah. in Mexico represents for the future of trilateral uh, cooperation between civil society? Maybe maybe one more question and then we'll we'll have responses. Thank you. Uh, Julien Durazo Herman, uh, Université de Québec à Montréal. So uh, actually, I'll cheat and ask two questions, one for each uh, presenter. Uh, so for Laura, um, I got very excited when you mentioned this multi-level analysis, and I thought about uh, the time when we met in 2004. I think it was this federalism and uh, North American free trade, and. Uh, then nothing came out of, in, in your talk about the, the role of subnational government, state level, municipal level. So maybe you could tell us a bit more about that uh, sub, uh, multi-level uh, right. dimension of, of uh, transnational activism. And uh, for Ms. McEwen, uh, I was, I'm trying to think because uh, when, when the Canadian announced the, the progressive trade agenda with uh, feminism and the indigenous rights and all that, um, it is my impression that in Mexico, people found it hard to take it seriously. And I wonder how, how far the, the labor movement in Canada went to Mexico to explain how this could be serious. And then you said, well, you took it at face value knowing that it was not exactly the point, but then how do you sell that kind of, of position to people that don't take it seriously to start with, you see? Um, sure, I can I can start there. So we we um, they didn't take it seriously, and especially given the experience of the labor and environmental side chapters uh, in the first NAFTA, it was easy to understand why they wouldn't. Um, and especially in terms of the the gender chapter, where they had the lovely meeting with Ivanka, and what they meant by feminism was better things for rich white women like that's not that's not feminist and 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 honestly meeting with staff and the ministers that didn't understand um what a feminist approach to trade might be like they they could not it's add women like comma women like we'll just search through the document for people and we'll add a comma and women and girls right they didn't understand that you have to understand maybe how how migrant women workers are affected differently and what regulations or laws you might change or not implement so that those outcomes didn't happen. Um, which is, is honestly difficult and they didn't have time to do that because Trump's like we're renegotiating it now. So that they didn't have time to do that real work. Um, and so they're like, no, we'll just have a press conference with Ivanka. Um, and and for the indigenous chapter, I mean, I think they did do real work with indigenous communities, but that's not something that resonated in Mexico at all. It's a completely different context for indigenous um, um, communities, and so that was a not a no go for the Mexican government. Um, so when we talked with labor unions that we did talk to, which included like the. Um, the engineers who all of the hydro plants had been privatized and they had bought a co-op plant to bottle um, water to keep some of their workers like the context that those workers were going to, through were so completely different than the context of American or and Canadian labor leaders right like they were literally fighting to for survival to pay their workers after their plants had been privatized and sold out from under them. Um, there were also, there's um, a section of that, like telephone book, telephone workers. Um, there's some university unions, like it's, it's, a, it's a weird coalition that's kind of held together of the independent unions in Mexico. So there are people to talk to, but it, it can shift. There's Metalos, like the, the steel workers. Um, and so, we knew who we could talk to, but we didn't think they had any sway with the government either, that there was any, and they weren't having any of our progressive trade agenda. They were just like, that, that's not reasonable. There, there were strikes when we were in Mexico, there were strikes because the price of gas was so hot, right? People were out in the streets striking. Um, and so, and the level of violence that you see uh, 
uh, you saw going on with the pre um, in in the south. It was just uh, there was no gains for them in working with us, so it, it didn't happen really. I mean, individual unions still did. Unifor did a lot of work with um, unions in Mexico. So Unifor went down and, and built Solidarity, which is fantastic. Um, the steel workers did the same thing. Um, even like the public sector workers went down and they tend to more work with um, Maquiladoras, sort of more development projects. So not necessarily unions, but uh, community groups. Uh, so that, that work did happen and is continuing to happen, but it, it didn't have a lot of impact on the actual negotiations. Thanks. Um, you know, the first question, I think it's important to resist the idea that civil society is either good or bad. I, I think it's a thing and it can be good or bad. And it's just like business could be good or bad or government could be good or bad. It's, it's an analytical category. It's not inherently progressive or not progressive. Um, and I think, you know, um, civil society actors don't, I have like this time delay on my mouth because um, of my jet lag. Um, <laughs> um, civil society actors tend to organize locally because, you know, it's hard to organize in Canada about what's happening in China about their bad use of coal. I was just appalled in Germany. They're still using tons of coal in Germany. I had no idea. <laughs> Yet they have this great environmental records. But, you know, it's not really the job of actors in Canada to mobilize that much about Chinese coal use. We, we need to focus on local issues. That's just a strategic reality. Um, about who are the counterparts? So. I just think it's a re the I don't think the labor chapter per se will be very important. I agree with Angela, although I think it's a good thing that it is entrenched. And if the Democrats could push it further in terms of how it's going to be implemented um, and enforced, um, it will be better. But right now, the way it's written, it has it could be worse than the, the labor side accord in a way, because at least the, under the labor side accord, citizens groups bring the cases forward, right? So, and that has happened. There have been cases brought forward. They haven't been all that active in recent years because there wasn't enough resources or commitment to it. But under the new chapter, who knows? Who's, who's going to have the political will to uh, bring forward a case against it? Which of the governments, because it will be a government that has to do it, right? under the new chapter, um, you know, which of those governments will decide to bring a case against one of their NAFTA allies um, for the sake of workers? We'll see, but uh, I'm not that positive. Uh, I think it's good that it happened, but it, it could be better. And, um, but what I'm really optimistic is about the current state of labor under the new government in Mexico, which for the first time does create the context in which we could see democratic unionism evolve, so it's not in a, a tiny, well not tiny, but a small belie beleaguered group fighting for their lives <laughs> at times. You know, these are people who are fighting for their literal lives, not just, you know, a job um, in the context of widespread violence and l complete lack of a rule of law. <laughs> so the, there's the broader uh, issue of governance in Mexico in general. If there were law, rule of law in Mexico, that would help the case of the labor movement. So th those are big issues that need to be addressed, and a trade agreement's not going to do that. Um, but specifically around labor reform, there are a series of reforms going forward um, that need to come together at some point into one specific uh, legislative package, um, which I assume is going to happen. And interestingly, I heard that um, the, the, the proposal that Morena made, the government made, has been challenged by feminist uh, labor activists as not taking into account the specific problems faced by women workers. Um, so the syndicalistas have put forward proposals to amend that uh, legislative framework. So that I think there's really interesting stuff going on. There's this new federation um, I think that's just a sign of the, the ferment, is that a right word, the right word? A ferment in the labor field. I, I mentioned on my slide, but didn't get to talk about the 
uh, outbreak or rash of strikes that happened in the Makila sector in the last month or so, most of which were successful in raising um, uh, uh, raising um, gosh salaries um, and getting better collective agreements. So I think that's like really promising, but it's just early days and it's hard to know which direction we'll go to into, but and maybe we could see some kind of merging of the various actors, because now I think there's various um, labor movement actors in, that are independent. We might see some transition from less independent to more independent uh, activity on the part of some of these unions that were co-opted for so many years by the government in the context of greater labor freedom. So mostly it's about right to association and, and the labor chapter in the or side accord did not address that, just completely failed to address that. Um, and so uh, that's what has to happen. And if it doesn't happen, I think there's gonna be big problems going ahead. I just wanted to add that one of the slogans, there was a, a group of us that were trying to get a slogan, um, raise wages, not walls, and to talk about how we needed to raise wages in Mexico, and that would affect benefit workers in all three countries. It would lower um, migration because there would be good jobs in Mexico. Um, uh, but again, I, th I think the, the Mexican uh, workers that we were talking to, they didn't have any faith that um, Obrador was any more on their side than Pinato was. Um, and so there was a, a great deal of cynicism um, that that would be successful. Um, so, and, and the kind of the Canadians, the American labor central was still kind of hedging with Trump. I think they felt like they could still get some stuff out of him and that some of their members like walls. So <laughs> they, um, they, they couldn't get on board with the raise wages, not walls slogan either. Is that right? Okay, just in the interest of time for the next panel, maybe we'll stop here. And I, I thought it was a great session, a great talk and discussion. Thank you. Thank you.